thank you. So, um, I, I mean, I, I, we were just talking, actually. I come here quite a lot. It's genuinely one of my favourite places to visit. I think I, I must have been here ten times in about the last ten years. I almost come every year, so... Yeah, it's a home from home almost. Great. Well, obviously, uh, Jian uh, did a wonderful introduction to you. Um, but we know that the term rock star these days is bandied about a lot. You hear about rock star presidents, Barack Obama, rock star central bankers, rock star economists. But you, quite literally, were a rock star, weren't you? So <laughs> tell us a little bit about your journey. And there you go, right there. You're the, 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 you play the second, keyboard, second, is that correct? Second from the right. Brilliant. <laughs> Fabulous. I love this. It's the 1980s. <laughs> that was the 1980s. Yes. I was about uh, 20 years old or 21 years old there. Right. Well, you, you look Keyboards amazing. And you still look amazing. <laughs> so, so there you are. Um, so, you know, tell us a little bit about this journey you had, because I'm sure you're asked this a lot uh, every time you're being interviewed. The journey from going, from playing the keyboards for Dare and d -Ream to what you're doing now, because you went and studied and became this amazing professor, and, you know, your expertise in science is unrivaled. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I should say that I see there are many uh, young people in the audience. So I was um, interested in astronomy from the age of as far back as I can remember. And, and I remember just being interested in those points of light in the sky. And then, as I remember a very famous quote by Carl Sagan, when he said the same thing. He's, but, but by the way, I should say, if you haven't seen Carl Sagan's Cosmos, it was released in 1980, in 1979. I still think it's the best science documentary that you could possibly watch. If you've not seen it, I recommend it. But Sagan said that, um, the thing about these points of light in the sky is that they become more magical the more you know. And I think that that applies throughout science. The understanding what these things are does not take away any mystery, it adds mystery and magic to them. So the idea that these are other suns, and we now know that probably every point of light you can see in the sky has planetary systems around it. We know that there are 20 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone, so we know so much about these things. But that, that captured my imagination from way back. Uh, but also, when I was, as you saw there, when I it was 14 or 15, um, I, I decided that I was... I, it, it wasn't that I was some sort of um, musician from an early age. In fact, I was self-taught, and I taught myself so that I could be a pop star. There was no, it wasn't an artistic decision based on a love of music. It was based on a love of being in the band, you know. I think I'd seen, I mean, you, many of you won't remember, but I mean, bands like, when I was growing up, bands like Duran Duran in particular, I particularly wanted to be a member of Duran Duran, <laughs> so I learned to play keyboards. Um, and then, so at the age of 18, I'd done my A-levels, um, and, and one sensible point I would make to everyone that's here, that I think you get one easy chance to do that. And I would strongly recommend whatever you want to do, uh, get to that age where you can, you're can you going to go to university, and then uh, I had the opportunity to take a year off, which many people do, I think, before I went to university. So I got into university, took a year off, got a record deal, sort of accidentally, <laughs> did you see that, and ended up taking five years off. But, but ultimately, did make the choice to go back to the University of Manchester at the age of 23. Um, and it was possible because I, I always wanted to do physics and astronomy, so I'd done the work at school, but I then, I sort of bought myself the chance to have a go at something else. I actually honestly always thought it would be temporary because I always wanted to be an astronomer. Um, but it became slightly less temporary because of the, the band became successful. So everyone, that's a lesson to you. Uh, if you put your mind to it, you can do it too. From being a pop star to what you do. You make it. You make it easy for yourself by taking the opportunity that you've got now. So, so you, you, although it sometimes seems like you know, I, I don't want to do this work necessarily at school. You, you, I think you, you buy yourself the opportunity to, to play around, and it could have been that I you know, decided to make an entire career in music, although I don't think so. I remember, I have a friend actually still to this day, and that was, we talked about back in 1989 there. I should say that the first gig, we, we, thought we supported Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Led Zeppelin. <laughs> oh, but, uh, uh, and, yeah, so, and he played that as an encore, it was a great thing wow. to see him do. Um, but but uh, there was a friend of mine who was the sound engineer on that tour, who I still keep in touch with, it's kind of 30 years later now, 
And he remembers me sitting on the tour bus with the book on special relativity, <laughs> so <laughs> reading about it even then. So I was an unusual pop star in that respect. So I used to go and get back on the bus and get him out of bunk on the tour bus and read books about relativity. Right. So, you know, Did you get teased a lot? Presumably you must have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I mean, that's extraordinary because everyone thinks of science geeks, but they certainly don't think of, you know, science rock stars. It's a complete reverse, uh, you know. Of, Central banker rock stars. That <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's Rob and Ron Rajan. We've like interviewed him a few times and called him that. Um, but moving on, uh, you're here, of course, to talk about fossil, forces of nature, which, uh, incidentally, I'm told I, I have to plug it, it is debuting on August the 18th, uh, BBC Earth Channel 400. The right angle, mutually exclusive um, answer. And the, the, the question about place in the universe is, is one such question. It's uh, in the series we call it, I, I call it our ascent into insignificance. So the science has been the story of a great ascent, into fr an ascent from the center of the universe to in one sense, an insignificant speck physically in, in a universe that's not only, I mean, in the observable universe, by the way, we, there are all the 350 billion large galaxies in it around the size of the Milky Way in count, so the smaller galaxies. We know the universe extends way beyond that. We, we have very strong evidence that we only see a small bubble of a much larger universe. And in fact, now there are theories um, of inflationary cosmology theories, which I um, think are the, probably the most likely to be correct at the moment, it's cutting edge cosmology. But they, these theories suggest that there might be more than one universe, and in fact potentially an infinite number of universes, uh, I was going to say like our own, but perhaps with different physical laws and different masses of the particles, etc. So we might live in a multiverse of, of infinite universes. So th that is definitely a physical demotion from the centre. But on the other hand, when you look at, particularly when you talk to biologists, and you look at the history of life on Earth, you can make quite strong arguments that perhaps civilizations in those galaxies are quite rare. And you can even make a, you can make an argument that there could be only one civilization currently in the Milky Way galaxy. Now that's, you, know, you can also make an argument that there may be quite a few. Uh, there are very few biologists, I think, who think there'll be a lot. So are you saying um, you believe in aliens? Do well, they exist? There, there, will, there, they will exist? Be micro, there will be microbes around. I, I, I would not be surprised at all if within your lifetimes we find life on Mars, below the surface, perhaps on Enceladus, like the moons of Saturn, or Europa, the moon of Jupiter, that the conditions look right in many places across the solar system to find microbes. But if you look at the history of life on Earth, Although life began with strong evidence about 3.8 billion, perhaps 4 billion years ago, so as soon as it could, pretty much on the Earth, um, the, the, it, it was not until 550 million years ago or so that you see evidence of complex life. And of course, the, the human, humans emerged from the Rift Valley. Some of those interviews there were in Ethiopia, one of my favourite countries to visit. Um, the, the, we emerged from the Rift Valley not long ago that our species emerged about 200 to 200 thousand years ago, let's say. So, so we, the, the, an intelligent civilization is, is that existed in the blink of an eye and took four billion years or so to emerge on this planet, which is a third of the age of the universe. So you can make arguments that we are, that intelligence in the universe will be a rare and therefore very valuable phenomenon. So you have these two things. You have one that, that physically we're not important, there's no doubt, there's nothing you can say <laughs> in a sea of infinite stars, probably. But the, the fact that the human universe addresses it with those shots that you saw, the people everywhere we went, we photograph people, there is meaning in the universe because it means something to us. And so irrespective of what you think and what you think about the beginning of the universe, whether you're religious, belief or non, it is true that the universe means something to us. And I think that's extremely important. So that's the, um, the, the, the centre of human universe, and that's why I like it. It's got a deep, it, it's got a polemical underpinning, which, which goes back, actually, as I mentioned, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. But when I first watched that, when I was 12 years old, the thing that struck me most was it was, it's really about what does cosmology and astronomy and science in general tell us about our place and how should it inform our behaviour? Um, knowing, perhaps, for example, let us assume that we 
we, we found that, that we were alone in the Milky Way galaxy, let's say. How should that inform our behaviour on Earth? It should. It is not naive to say that the, the, the perspective that astronomy gives us should make us value our planet and should make us behave differently to each other and to the natural world because we know that we're an isolated and rare speck in a vast cosmos. That leads into talks of climate change and, and various other things. Um, but again, you talked about being in Ethiopia, you talked about being in the Amazon. I watched uh, uh, Wonders of the Universe last night. I mean, in one episode, you were in Peru, Costa Rica, the Namibian coast. Um, you know, it's extraordinary filming in all these different locations. And tell us a little bit about what it's like, uh, the experience of filming, uh, how the programs are then developed, how long does it take to come to fruition, for instance, Forces of Nature? How long has that taken? Oh, well, well, Forces well, of Nature took ages, okay, actually. I think it took about a year longer than it should have done, according to, according to the budget. <laughs> um, be, because, actually, the Forces of Nature was a real a challenge, because, um, because of the, the idea that it was supposed to appeal to a wide audience, but we have this this underpinning, this idea that we're really, as I said, this Keplerian idea perhaps that we're looking at the underlying structures. So, so uh, intellectually it's very difficult. The, 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 the travel is, um, we tend to, we, you t the, I suppose the challenge of putting scientific ideas, especially abstract ideas about cosmology on like television, is how do you do it without resorting just to graphics? It's so you know, tempting to just show graphics of stars and galaxies and planets. But actually, if you want to... I think that there are different messages, as we've discussed in science. Well, one is that it, there are interesting facts about the size of the universe and the scale of the universe, etc. But there's also that idea of what does it mean? What, what, what are we to make of these facts? And that is better done in a, in a human setting, I think, because science is a human pursuit at the heart. So you try to choose places where, where the, there's a backdrop which tells you something and adds something to the story. So a good example in, in Human Universe would be, would be Easter Island. We filmed, there's a film which I like very much in, this, in, the, in Human Universe called Are We Alone? which is addressing these questions about life on other worlds. Um, and we chose Easter Island as one of the uh, places to film. Now it's an evocative place, Easter Island, but it has this backstory of a place that Ultimately, the historians still argue, actually, there's some controversy, but the, the, the standard story is that there was an environmental catastrophe, essentially. And it's true that when you go there, there are no trees. It looks like sort of one of the more barren areas of Scotland, actually, although it's a Pacific island, um, because it seems that the civilization uh, inflicted environmental damage on itself. Um, that they got very obsessed with an ancestor worship culture. They wanted to build their big stone heads. Uh, it looks like there's some evidence of fighting between the villages on this isolated outcrop, and in the end they damage themselves. Um, and uh, that's obviously the parallels are there, as you mentioned. You know, the Easter Island is a metaphor for our planet. We are uh, an island amongst a sea of stars, in the same way that's an isolated island in an ocean. And, um, and, and so that, that gives you an extra texture. So, so that the choice is, is sort of obvious, but it's, so we, we always try and choose places that will give you that, that human backdrop, because that's really the story that we want to tell, as well as the science. Now, next up, I'm going to do something um, a little bit unusual, and I, I know I'm going to ask you to do this, and I know you can do this, because I've seen you do it on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, basically, um, I'm going to try, let me see if I can get my clock up. I want you to just, you know, basically describe, and you've been amazing at describing all these very complex ideas. I want you to describe um, quantum uh, mechanics in 60 seconds. And I'm going to time you, and the reason I'm doing this, there's a very good reason actually, which I'll explain after. Um, but um, oh gosh, I can't seem to get my stopwatch. My stopwatch up. Okay, here we go. Stopwatch. Actually, 60 seconds. I mean, can I preface it by saying that I'm going to give you? I'm going to, I'm going to give you the 60 second. Version. This is a view of quantum mechanics, which um, I share with a particle theorist. It's a very particle physicist view of quantum mechanics. Okay, all right. Well, let me start my uh, stopwatch. There you go. I'm going to start it on my iPad. Okay, start now. So I start from the view that particles are particles. So quantum mechanics is really a theory of how particles move around. 
And the central idea, there's only one, listen down to which to find them, is I start with the particle here. The question we want to know is what's the probability that it will be somewhere over here at some time later? And quantum mechanics gives you a set of rules that allow you to calculate that. The only strange bit in what I said there is I said the probability. And that's where the, uh, the counterintuitive nature of quantum mechanics comes in. In, in classical physics, you would say, if I have a particle here and it's moving with some velocity, um, then I know exactly where it's going to be at some time later. Whereas in quantum mechanics, the only difference is that we have rules that tell you the probability that it's going to be some place later. And that's it. And there's one rule that tells you that. You did that in 51 seconds. <laughs> well done. Because we're, we're going into this next idea that uh, really important to show how crucial science communication is um, to explain these elaborate, complicated concepts in very simple terms to, to labor. That's a real, real talent. So tell us, is that something that can be taught? How did you learn it? Or are you quite simply a genius? <laughs> no, I mean, not at all. I think it's very important actually to emphasize that, um, that scientists are not freaks in any way. So, so it's often, I think, sometimes, especially amongst uh, younger people, like many of yourselves, that you think, well, I'd love to be Einstein, but I'm no Einstein. But then um, Einstein once said that when I was young, I was no Einstein. <laughs> so you could, um, the, the, the point is that really it's about, um, it's about doing some work, uh, being in, be, wanting to know, having an almost romantic attachment to wanting to understand the natural world, and then, and then working at it, that's what you need to be a scientist. And I think that when, when you, I say, to, I teach um, first year uh, quantum mechanics and relativity at Manchester University. So in September, I'll be teaching people not much older than many of you. Um, and, and the first thing I say to them is that take responsibility for your own understanding. So I actually want to abolish exams in the first year at Manchester. It's semi-controversial. The reason I want to do that is because I think that you know when you understand something. And actually the skill that you need to develop, to the only skill I would say to be a scientist, is intellectual honesty. So you say, do I understand it or not? If I don't, I'll carry on until I do. Once you've done that, it becomes easy to communicate it because you've spent the time. The, the, the most difficult person to convince or to, to make understand something is yourself. And when you understand it, you know. You don't need me, so as a teacher, you don't need me to tell you actually, is what I say to my students. You know, it, it, when you answer a problem, you know if you've got it right, you know when you've understood it. And that's the skill that you need to learn and develop and have conf intellectual confidence. So that's it really. The, the, it's very easy to explain something if you spend, you know, months or years trying to understand it yourself. And I'll just say one last thing is, is that I find, when I work with theoretical physicists in particular, You'll, you'll find that, that many of them are very slow, very slow and methodical. And you understand why. If, if you're doing, trying to work something out that's research, if you're trying to do research, you don't know what the answer is. So the only thing you can do is convince yourself that you're likely to be, you're likely to have not got it wrong. The, the, the very last thing I would say, because it puts me in mind of something that Richard Feynman, I just gave his version of quantum theory, which is the best one in my view. Um, it's called the path into blue approach. You know. um, but um, Feynman wrote an essay called The Value of Science uh, back in the 1950s based on a lecture he gave. And he said the most valuable thing about science is its philosophy. And he called it a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance. So he said that's all it is. So, so you, you, your philosophy is that you're probably wrong, um, you're never absolutely right, and the, when you're shown to be wrong, then you have a big smile because you've learned something about the way the universe works. <laughs> it is not like that. And that is actually the, the, the experience of being a scientist almost always is to be wrong. But the, the idea that you're never absolutely right, Feynman said, is the thing that we can take into the wider sphere, into politics uh, even. You know, so the fact that, the fact that um, essentially our politics is a, is a trial and error system at best, which is that you try something, um, you do it, and then, and then if it doesn't quite work, then you, you, you try something else. In, in some countries, you, 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 might be, you might be voted out by the electorate or whatever, but you know, it's, it's a trial and error system, ultimately. And, and the, 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 when it goes wrong is when there are people who have absolute ideas, 
and, and it's, it's absolutely the problem. And, and science absolutely is the, probably the first field of human endeavor where that was widely accepted. You see, it. I mentioned this, um, the Arab scientist Al Hazard, who, who looks at rainbows, he wrote a beautiful thing, a thousand years, it was 900 and something AD in um, modern day Iran, actually, where he was based. And he wrote that down. He, he said that, he said, do not, do not get convinced about things. Test your ideas against nature. You, if, if your ideas disagree with nature, they are wrong and you move on and you're delighted. He wrote that a thousand years ago. Well, that brings me to my next, I, uh, my next question, which is really interesting. You mentioned no exams, or you at least this slightly controversial idea that you don't want to give exams well, to your students. But, eventually, but, um, no. but, but I should, uh, well, just to say, it's really interesting because this audience here, you are pretty much preaching to the converted because last year, according to the OECD, uh, which ranked Singaporean 15 year olds the smartest in the world. So you are looking at some of the smartest kids in the world when it comes to maths and science. Yes. So, you know, and, and just, you know, it's interesting, and again, this idea that, like, that you don't need exams, because that was an exam these kids took in order to be ranked as such. But um, how should science be taught then? Because, I mean, you touched a little, a little on it just now, this whole notion that uh, perhaps science can be taught um, beyond rote learning, uh, you know, to, to spark the innovation and the creativity that you speak about, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? I mean, the, the correct thing to say is you, you need both. Because as you well know, the, the reason that you said Singapore is the most successful country in the world in, in science education is partly that there, is a, there are technical skills that you need to acquire, of course. I mean, Galileo said that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. So that's true, it appears, that mathematics is the language best suited to describe your nature. Therefore, you have to learn it. And I, I also, I often compare mathematics to learning to play a musical instrument, just in the sense that no one expects to be able to sit down in front of the piano or the guitar and just play it. Everyone understands you need to practice. But actually, that, that's true also of mathematics or, or a foreign language. I know many of you, I think all of you speak at least two languages in Singapore, which is nothing to be celebrated. And, and so you, you have to learn it. So there's that, which is true. But the there's also the idea that you, beyond that, when you have the language, the, the, the idea that it is a, nature is a beautiful thing, and it is, it, it is probably, in my view, the best way you can spend your life trying to understand how it works. And that would be the, whether it's um, you know, living organisms or the origin of the universe or whatever, you, you will find beauty and, and, and wonder and excitement right across the sciences. Um, so that also should not be lost. And, and also that central idea, as I mentioned earlier, of, of taking responsibility for your own understanding. You put all those together, so excitement and curiosity and delight in exploring nature, plus the technical ability to do it, which you, anyone can learn if they practice, um, plus that idea that you take responsibility for yourself, then you will be a great scientist or engineer or, or, well, actually, a great anything, I suppose, in any field. So, kids, you heard it here. You're all going to go far. Um, that is, if you took well, one of those. It seems like you're, really <laughs> you're, you're in the you're in a, a, a structure, an educational structure, which is obviously giving you those tools. So then it just it's then up to you to to find the joy. And once you've done that, off you go. So we're expecting very, very smart questions uh, from all of you towards the end of this discussion. Uh, I expect nothing less than the most brilliant of questions. Um, now, interesting, you talked a lot about policy and uh, you know, you talked about Easter Island sort of being a microcosm for the world and what we're doing to it now, this whole notion of climate change. So, so science communication really is more crucial now than ever, isn't it? Especially when you have to get into you know, the, the whole topics of climate change, yeah. you know, policies, government policies. Tell us a little bit about well, that. I mean, you hear, um, I, I don't know if you do here in Singapore, but certainly in, in Britain at the moment, in America, you hear that we live in a post-fact world, right? And you see it in the, in the behavior of the, of, of the, I suppose, of the electorate in some sense. But, um, and obviously there are more complicated reasons for the way that people vote. But this, this, this idea that we live in a post-fact world in some areas of the world, is uh, very worrying because we've lived in a post-fact world before, which was the Stone Age, you know. And then, uh, so so we, we can do that if we want. The, but the, our progress 
into into civilization through the history of the spread of humans out of the Rift Valley and into the Fertile Crescent. And the, the, the history of over 10,000 years um, has been one of, of specialization, of, of, of intellectual progress, of understanding evidence and basing technology, but also decisions on the way you run your countries on evidence. You know, those things are central. And uh, so I think that science for me, that idea that Feynman went back to, the satisfactory philosophy of ignorance, that this is the way that we built our civilization to the 21st century civilization that we see today, which is broadly speaking, um, well integrated, the global, um, the world is probably more open than it's ever been. But at the same time, we seem to have this, um, the beginnings of the crisis in certain areas, probably more in the, in the West than in Asia, you might maybe comment on that, but. Um, so, it ultimately, I think that the value of evidence and the, 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 the idea which lies at the heart of science, that your, your opinion is utterly worthless in the face of nature, right? It, it doesn't matter. It's like I sometimes say when you have an opinion, people have opinions about, um, let's, say, let's say climate change, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, the only point to make is that there, if you ask a question about the future, so a legitimate question, what will our climate be like in a hundred years' time, um, given different scenarios on how we continue with fossil fuel burning, etc. Then um, the only way you can answer that is to model it. Um, all models are wrong, very famous quote, that no models are right, but um, the, the, it is more likely that you will be correct if you have a model than if you don't. Right? So the only thing you can say about, about climate modelling is that the people who spend their career modelling the climate are more likely to be right than the people who don't spend their career <laughs> modelling the climate, and that's it. It's like the analogy I've been drawing with an aircraft. It, 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 it is true that an a, a randomly selected passenger in the aircraft has a chance of landing the aircraft safely on the runway. The captain has a higher chance because he spent his life learning how to fly aircraft. And that's all we're saying about so that those, those simple ideas about expertise, and what expertise is, it is not the idea that scientists or someone else, or economists, or someone, can, can sit on a mountain and hand down pronouncements of the way that we should behave. That's not true at all. It is just more likely that an economist will have a model that predicts the future trajectory of the economy than someone who isn't an economist. That's it. That, that's all. There. So it's, it's about being humble in a way. And the second part of the crisis, to get to your original question, is that people have got the wrong view, uh, perhaps because of the way we communicate as scientists and experts and in inverted commas or economists. People have got the wrong view about what we think of ourselves. Uh, we don't think that we're right. In fact, it's quite the opposite. As I said before, we think that we're probably wrong, but slightly more likely. <laughs> slightly less likely to be horribly wrong than the, the people who didn't study. <laughs> that's, that's all. Well, actually, the guys, you know, we talk. Many things to say about that clip, actually. One thing is, so the the, the, the program itself was made for BBC One, which in the I, I usually make my programs for BBC Two. So BBC One's a, a more uh, you expect a wider audience, let's say. So um, that 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 so when we were talking in, during the production, um, it was said we have some beautiful things to talk about the tides. In, in the film, there's a there's a wonderful tidal wave that sweeps up the Amazon called the Pororoca, a spectacular thing. And one of the film crew spent a long time, very difficult filming trip actually, filming this tidal wave. And there's a crazy guy that spends his life surfing it. So he surfs the tidal wave of the Amazon for tens of kilometres. It's a very interesting thing. But then, two, so we film that. But the, but then the, um, the, uh, the the question was to me was so you can explain the tides, can't you? And, and I said, well, yes, but you do know that it's quite complicated. And, and it's like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, but it's spectacular. But but it is, as you see, even that I mean, it doesn't fully do it justice. Um, the, the the explanation that I liked most, and there, there are different ways of explaining the tides. But that is based on um, an explanation by a very famous physicist called Richard Feynman, who wrote three great books I would recommend to any physicist called the Feynman Lectures. They, they, they were written back in the 1960s, actually. But they're still classic physics texts. And he points out, as I say there, that the, the tides, you can't understand it as a static 
system. You, you, you say, well, okay, so, so here's the moon, here's the Earth. You, people tend to wave their hands around and say, well, the moon kind of pulls everything towards it, um, and then you get this tide on one side and tide on the other. But if you think about that, then if the moon's pulling everything towards it, then why doesn't everything fall towards the moon and hit it, is the first question you ask. Um, and of course the reason is that the, in this, the same way that the, the Earth pulls the moon towards it, but the moon doesn't just hit the Earth, because it's in orbit, so it's falling and missing. The Earth is falling and missing around the moon as well. And we don't tend to think of that. And in fact the Earth is, as I said, just wobbling around in an orbit around what's called the common centre of mass, those two things. And it's all quite, so you'll see, it, but, but it's quite a complicated explanation actually, and in fact, you, you can the, the, you can look at there's a postgraduate textbook I, 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 I've got by Carl Murray on a he's an expert on ring planetary ring systems like the rings around Saturn so he works at NASA and and he um, wrote a textbook and in there there's a proper treatment of the tides but it's for postgraduates so they're quite a complicated thing so that was the kind of <laughs> the, the least the, the, the fastest. Uh, but I think still correct explanation of the times. But that's what we love about your shows and, and the fact that you present those shows, and I, I will touch upon this later, this idea that you can simplify such incredibly complex ideas to make them understandable for lay people uh, like ourselves. Uh, but moving on, in Forces of Nature, you also, um, and I'd love to hear more about it, I'm going to watch it, you've got, everyone's heard of rainbows, right? But you've got something called moon bows. Tell us a little bit about that. And did you actually manage to film one? Yes, they're, they're beautiful um, phenomena. I mean, it's obvious in a sense that a rainbow, how is it formed? It's formed by um, sunlight essentially entering water droplets and, and, and going into them, reflecting off the back face, refracting out of them again. Um, and the, the, the paths that the, 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 the light beams, if you like, take uh, depend on the colour, so they're, they're slightly different, and so you split them. So, so, but if, but also there are places on the Earth where if you get a full moon and you get the right geometry, then the reflected moonlight can do the same thing. It can go into raindrops and come out again, and in particularly uh, waterfalls. So you know the geometry will be right. And there's a particular waterfall in Iceland um, where this happens, and when the full moon is in the right place, it can be bright enough to to create a rainbow. And it looks to, to the, actually to the eye, you can see it, and you can just see the dim colours. But to the sensitive cameras, you see you get a full rainbow, it's the same thing, you still have white light essentially coming off the moon, and so you get a moonbow. Which is actually that the, the idea behind forces of nature um, is that nature is simple at the most basic level, which is probably the greatest discovery that we've made in modern science, that there's a simple framework within which you can understand everything, including, uh, in principle, biology and life and the origin of life. Um, and we, we found a book um, which Kepler wrote. So Kepler is most famous with Laws of Planetary Motions, 1609, 1611 or so. Um, he noticed regularities in the way the planets move, um, notice that they that can be explained if they're moving in elliptical orbits around the sun. That's the foundation for Newton's law of gravitation back in 1687, about some 70 years later or so. So Kepler was undoubtedly a great physicist. But in 1610, he wrote a book called On the Six-Cornered Snowflake, which I haven't been aware of, actually. And it's a work of genius. And I wouldn't use that word lightly, but it, the, Basically, Kepler, the story is he was walking across a bridge in Prague and a snowflake landed on his arm and then another one, another one, another one. And he's looking at them and he said, well, there's something similar about them. Uh, they're all different, but there's something, the number six about them, they're six-sided. Um, why? And he says in the book, this is 1610, that it must be telling you something about the structure of the building blocks of the snowflake. You know, there's a symmetry which must be reflecting the symmetry of something deeper. Now that is a 21st century insight. It's, it's one of the deepest insights, I suppose, in modern theoretical physics, that there are, there are symmetries, there's, there's regularity in structure, and in the laws of nature, and the structures you see in the large structures, even up to human beings, the stars and planets and galaxies, are in some sense a reflection of a deeper underlying structure. So you can read the underlying structure by paying attention to the things that we can see in natural structures. 
That's a very modern way of looking at physics. And the fact that Kepler had that language, it's almost explicit in the book, in 1610. So, so this is, a, this is a, a mind not of its age, but a, 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 it, he would have been comfortable 400 years later. But I really recommend it. It's a beautiful book. You get it on Kindle now, or, you know, it's, it's available. So, so that would form the basis of the series. So we, can we use, so things like rainbows, moonbows are a good example. You look at the history of science, a thousand years ago, particularly in, in the Arab world, you have scientists, there's a famous uh, scientist called Al Hazen, who's a, that's his kind of abbreviated name, who almost got the idea of rainbows right a thousand years ago. Um, and, and certainly you see that the foundation of the study of light um, Newton looked at them, Descartes looked at them, all, many of the great scientists, because it's an obvious thing to try and understand. What is it? And, and you can see the path towards understanding the behavior of light, which today is absolutely fundamental in communications, obviously electronic waves, Wi-Fi, whatever you've got, all those things. You can trace the intellectual journey back to understanding something as, as beautiful as a, as a rainbow. And I'll just say one last thing, is it, it tells you something very important that, I think, for policymakers as well which is that the curiosity-led exploration of nature does tend to lead to, very, to great profound discoveries that, that can change the world, great profound technological shifts. The reason for that is that because there's an underlying structure to nature which is simple and understandable, all roads lead to it. So rainbows lead to an understanding of light which is tremendously useful. Um, studying you know, the, the structure of atoms, like to quantum theory, which is necessary to understand how to build transistors, and so the whole of the modern electronic age arguably is built on trying to understand atoms, etc., etc. And I think so. I think that's the deep reason why that the all curiosity-led exploration of nature leads to the underlying structure, which is obviously useful to understand. As a rant, <laughs> no, this is wonderful. It's, it's mind-bending. It's extraordinary. I've been listening to you, and I know all of you have been wrapped in attention as well. Um, now, you mentioned policy. We'll get to that later. But what's also really interesting is you mentioning um, all these wonderful um, programs that you've done. You know, the places that you've been, where you film. Uh, another show that you said actually is your favourite is uh, Human Universe. Uh, we can watch a clip of that too, and then we can chat a little bit about that after. So